An 836 Bonanza over the water, and the question is to ditch or not to ditch? Uh, well, that's actually not the question, so stick with us on Flywire uh, for the question. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to look at a ditching and a bonanza. Specifically in this video, I want to look at uh, the A36-134 Papa that was ditched in Half Moon Bay back in August 2019. I think there are some interesting facts about this case and some lessons learned that we can glean from it, so uh, we're going to do that. Uh, frankly, this ditching smells to me. When <laughs> I think you're going to find out why. You'll see why I mean. In the end, I want you to be the judge. I'm not going to offer my judgment. Um, ditching an airplane is a serious thing to do. <clears throat> in fact, it's a rarity, but it is so serious that I'm going to do a series of videos on this topic. Um, say you're flying over water and your propulsion fails for some reason. Well, and if you don't, you can't glide to land, well, you're going to have to land in the water. There's just no other choice about it. Airplanes have been flying over water for years, and they've also been ditching in the water for years. Uh, Sully uh, proved that in the uh, U.S. Air Airplane in New York. Big airplanes and small have uh, sunk beneath the waves, so what are the odds of survival? Actually, they are pretty good, okay? The survival rate is better, is a bit better than 85%. In fact, most of the fatalities occur after the water landing. Uh, preparation is key to survival. If you're going to fly over water, you need to be prepared. And the ditching of 134 Papa actually highlights the right and the wrong way, the, the things in, that happened here, and the problems with survival in the water. And we're going to look at that in this accident, <clears throat> what happened and why. We're going to highlight the things that went right and the ones that went wrong. And in the next video, I'm going to open it up to uh, the dis ditching discussion a bit for some real pointers is what is the best way to plan to survive a ditching and uh, when you should be prepared for that. But um, I don't know about you, but I rarely fly over water farther than land that, uh, you know, because I, I don't fly further away from land than I can swim to, and I'm not a very good swimmer. I usually fly, I used to fly from North Carolina to Florida quite a bit, and the shortest route was over the water. I went the long way around. So let's unpack this Bonanza accident. The day was August 20th, 2020, 2019, and it's almost six in the evening Pacific time, uh, 5.53 actually. So uh, 134 Papa was a turbo normalized A36 Bonanza with an IO550 engine and tip tanks. The trip was, on its face, not unusual. So let's follow the breadcrumbs. The accident chain actually started at North Las Vegas Airport the day earlier. A30, the A36 was fueled with 66 gallons and flew from North Las Vegas to Reed Hillview, that's our HV, uh, just outside of San Francisco. After a quick stop there, the airplane continued on to Hayward Executive, HWD. And the pilot, the pilot reported to the NTSB that he had used the fuel boost pump on low during the climb out from our HV, attributing it to the hot temperatures of the day middle of the summer. At uh, HWD, he refueled with 20 gallons late in the evening. And by my calculation, the previous day's flight would have taken about two and a half hours, the pilot said two to two and a half hours, and burned about 33 gallons. If they flew over the mountain pass uh, at Mono Lake, that's how long it would take. If they took the southern route through the valleys, it would take about three hours and over 40 gallons of gas. So I think they took the mountain pass. And the guys from Colorado, he's used to flying over mountains all the time. Uh, on the day of the accident, the pilot reported uh, noting black flaky sediment in the fuel tank during the sump operation. And he had to sump each tank four to five times to clear the material from the tester. That morning, the A36 flew from uh, Hayward to Reed Hillview, RHV, to pick up a passenger. And then they continued on to Monterey Regional Micromeo Yankee. Once again, reporting fuel oscillations from 11 to 16 gallons per hour, which is kind of low, uh, for a turbo normalized airplane, and he used the fuel boost pump to overcome that. By my calculations, when they landed, they had about 49 gallons of fuel on board. Later in the afternoon, they departed for a private strip about 20 miles north of uh, MRY, and from there, the flight led to 
RHV again to read Hillview, this time to drop off one of the passengers so he could pick up a 182, a Cessna 182. On the accident flight, uh, the intention was that they would fly formation and take pictures, possibly of the Golden Gate Bridge and its environs. The AT ATC tapes revealed that the flight was at or below 2,500 feet transiting the Class B airspace, and the Cessna pilot reported they were going to descend below 1,000 feet. The controller terminated radar services and told them to squawk VFR approximately 20 minutes after takeoff. So for me, there's a little discrepancy in the altitudes and the sequence of flight, of the flight in the prelim, uh, the NTSB's preliminary report. There happens to be a ridge line that cuts between, between San Jose and Half Moon Bay. <coughs> Excuse me. The ridge line is about 2,500 feet, and there's no mention of it. About 31 minutes after takeoff, the accident pilot reports that he was in a descending left turn about 3,000 feet when the engine became quieter. The JPI indicated zero fuel flow and the temperatures began falling. The pilot switched the fuel boost pump to low and then high and with no effect he switched it off. He manipulated the throttle, the propeller and the mixture controls to no effect. Passing through 500 feet he switched the fuel tanks and for a brief second the engine ran and then didn't. And he informed the Cessna of the problem and his plan to ditch gear and flaps up. He held the airplane about 10 feet above the water and let it settle onto the water. The pilot and passenger got out of the airplane uninjured and stood on the wing with, small, with some small items that they had retrieved from the airplane, hopefully to float with. In about 50 seconds, they could no longer stay on the airplane and it slipped the, beneath the waves about a minute later. Got some pictures of it before it, it sank. Uh, just before the engine issue, the accident pilot took two videos, both of which were posted on Instagram. The second video was 16 seconds long and it had taken it was taken about three miles from the ditching spot showing the left turn just prior to power loss. In that video you can see the JPI 450 fuel scan showing a fuel flow of about 18.6 gallons per hour and the, and the fuel pressure gauge indicating about 11 gallons per hour. This pressure gauge is actually marked in flow rate, okay? Kind of confusing but that's the way it is. The fuel gauges showed about 15 gallons of fuel in the left tank and about 20 gallons in the right. This matches my calculations of about 35 gallons on board the airplane given the flying down over the last two days and how much fuel was reportedly put into it. Seems pretty clear cut. So let's look at the breadcrumbs again before we look at the ditching and the aftermath. There was enough fuel on board the airplane. Okay, that's a good thing. The biggest red flag was those black flaky debris in the fuel. Several times the pilot reported needing to use the fuel boost pump to keep the engine running or sta to stabilize the fuel flow. And if, the and if the fuel bladder is coming apart, that's exactly what you're gonna see. I've seen it before, and that's all bad. You're not gonna get it, clear it by draining the sump. As an aside, using the fuel boost pump like this is not a standard thing in Bonanzas. The behavior, this behavior is a flag that is something is wrong, the airplane's talking to you, and it should be investigated. When you have to do something so out of the ordinary to keep the engine running, uh, you have a problem. And land it and sort it out. The accident pilot had owned the airplane for approximately two months, and for most of that time it had been in maintenance to upgrade a few things, install tip tanks, flap gap seals, uh, three cylinders, things like that. And he reported four hours in the airplane before the upgrades, 10 hours in the airplane afterwards, Frankly, I don't see much time for a proper checkout in the Bonanza, but there you have it. Um, I guess that's just me. Using, uh, as for using the fuel boost pump, <clears throat> it did not seem a surprise to him because he said he was told it was common in turbo-normalized airplanes. Well, the answer is that's true at altitude during full power high fuel climbs, but not high fuel flow climbs, but not for takeoffs. So the breadcrumbs lead us to the conclusion that the engine quit due to fuel starvation from a fuel blockage. Okay, the cause is neatly wrapped up and tied with a bow. Nice to have that video, such a straightforward answer to the question. So hold that thought and then let's cut to the film. It's the terrifying moment. A plane crash lands in the Pacific Ocean. David just crashed into the ocean. Digit failure. Miraculously, the downed pilot and his passenger make it out alive. 
climbing on the wing of the, the sinking fish. plane. There she goes. As the aircraft sinks, they gather everything that will stay afloat and shoot cell phone video of their entire ordeal. So we're out here in the Pacific Ocean floating around. Woo! Got some uh, homemade flotation devices here in the form of seat cushions and window shades. The water's a little bit cold, but we're all right. I set it down real easy. No one got hurt. They're okay. stung several times by jellyfish. And all this time they're treading water, he continues oh, yeah. his selfie shooting. Starting to get a little cold out here. Lots of jellyfish bobbing around. It happened nine miles off San Francisco. David Lesh and his companion Kayla were in his single-engine Beechcraft Bonanza when it lost power. Flying above them is David's close friend, fellow pilot Owen Leipelt, sending out Mayday calls to the Coast Guard. David and Kayla were adrift in the ocean for about 40 minutes. Luckily, a Coast Guard rescue helicopter was on a training mission nearby. And this is the moment David and Kayla knew they would be saved. And the whole time... Okay, the uh, accident pilot announced that he had lost the engine to his flight mate, who just happened to be there to film it all and act as a rescue coordinator. Uh, it was actually very fortunate for the two people in the water uh, because he, th that he was there. And I'm not being funny here. Given the temperature of that Pacific Ocean water in August, they had about 10 maybe 15 minutes before they couldn't use their hands anymore and about an hour on average some people say that's the low side but about an hour till exhaustion and losing consciousness and then you're sinking in the water and you're not there anymore two hours on the high side but that's about all they had they had no protection no personal flotation devices no raft virtually no clothes no signaling devices no radio in short they had nothing they were not prepared to survive. And in the pilot's defense, he actually admitted to that act or that omission later on in his various uh, uh, discussions on the topic. Having the wingman airborne over the ditching was indeed a stroke of luck. And the bonus was he filmed the whole thing because, of course, they had cell phones, <coughs> waterproof cell phones. The Cessna pilot notified the, a controller of the ditching at about 1753. That's 5:53 to use them, you guys, in Rio Linda. Uh, and about a minute before, there's about a minute before the touchdown on the water. <clears throat> the Coast Guard helicopter arrived at 18:30, about 37 minutes later. The pilot of the Cessna did a good job of keeping the survivors in sight, pretty much, and occasionally talking to him on the cell phone. He showed the rescue helicopter where to go. In fact, if he hadn't been there, those, those two in the water probably would not have survived the first hour. Uh, just wouldn't have, because by the time they got picked up, they were, they were not in great shape. They were just right here at the precipice. And we can see from the film that the accident pilot actually did a really good job of setting the airplane down on the water. The pilot pointed towards the shore, even though it was downwind, uh, the seas were calm. There were no significant waves to land parallel to, so it was actually a pretty nice uh, conditions to do the ditching. And, but they didn't open the door prior to impacting the water. Not a good thing. Uh, at one point, the chase airplane lost sight, and the accident pilot talked him back onto them using that cell phone. The survivors reported that after about 25 minutes in the water, hypothermia began to set in. He couldn't use his hands. The accident pilot was filming the post-ditching experience within 31 seconds of stepping on the water. He got out on the wing, you know, floating in the water, continuing commentary, you know, normal look at me stuff. It seemed like uh, getting a video for Instagram was more important than the actual survival effort. From my perspective, that's an interesting priority. Uh, so, what do we have here so far? Well, actually, it seems like a pretty clear-cut case of a mechanical fuel starvation incident that forced a ditching followed by a dramatic rescue. A little buffoonery during the rescue, perhaps, uh, but, you know, they're Instagram, Instagram kind of people. So it's not real unless it's documented, right? Well, the thing that smells fishy here is the social media campaign that started right after the accident. The whole thing was posted on Instagram and on chat boards across the internet uh, for about a couple of days. TV appearances went on. Uh, not, you know, and this isn't necessarily an indictment of bad intent, but it's not strictly kosher either. Um, 
Maybe that's just I'm old. <laughs> Here comes the part where you, you be the judge, okay? It turns out the pilot has a long track record of self-promotion using social media. The pilot was a well-known celebrity of sorts in the snow skiing world for doing outrageous stunts. And he started his own brand of outerwear and used stunts to gain coverage for himself and his brand of clothing. Check this out. I'm David Lesh, founder of Vertica Outerwear. I started out as a professional skier. Yeah, man. I saved up and bought this airplane so I could transport drugs from Mexico to Colorado. Organiza la próxima entrega. I was sick and tired of riding for companies that made shitty, ugly, overpriced outerwear. A few of the highlights since 2014 uh, in, in uh, the pilot's wake. He was arrested for, in 2014 for arson, and he was jailed. And it seems like uh, he made a big bonfire out of shopping carts, poured gasoline all over it, and then drove through the pyre with a Jeep. Of course, the whole thing was on video with a big production crew and everything. So in April of 2019, he reportedly crashed a Bonanza in Mexico and was taken hostage by a drug cartel. Oh, by the way, this stunt came out on April Fool's Day. But, here's the big but, CNN picked up this one and ran with it. Note the picture of the drug cartel guys. You know, it actually looks like that promo, promo video uh, for uh, his uh, outerwear brand. In uh, July 2019, he was photographed snowmobiling in a wilderness area close to mechanized vehicles. And it's not apparent that there was actually any snow on the ground, according to the video he took of himself. And other people shot him as well pictures. A month later this ditching incident occurred, okay, and this investigation is ongoing, uh, but it is fortunate for the pilot the A-36 sank in about 145 feet of water. So somebody would have to be really serious to want to go recover that thing. In uh, June of 2020, while waiting for his court date for the snowmobiling incident, he posted a picture of himself walking on a log projecting out into a protected lake. Yeah, a lot of folks are pretty serious about those uh, uh, protected wildlands, and uh, they were pretty upset. And the week before he was doing court for his previous transgressions, he was posted, he posted on another photo of himself defecating into another protected lake. These annex garnered a lot of attention for himself and his brand of outlaw outerwear, and the judge, however, he wasn't impressed, and he banned him from national parks for life. A rogue bad boy? Living a lavish life full of adventure and danger? Yeah, whatever. <clears throat> but when looked at, the, when we look at the ditching of 134 Papa from a bigger perspective, including all this stuff, well, it does seem to have a, be a little bit suspect. You be the judge. Was it real or was it staged? If it was real, the pilot is guilty of mis misidentifying the debris and the fuel leading directly to the loss of the airplane and endangering their lives. Uh, it's a little bit of a, you know, oblivious kind of behavior in my view. The evidence supports this conclusion, that video, and uh, what he, his way he talked through what happened. Uh, the worst outcome is that it was staged, and the pilot callously used it, or used all of us, and pilots, our industry, in a quest for fame. If that is the case, he took some pretty much bigger risks than his previous stunts. This was actually life-threatening and he wasn't that far from the problem. Did he think the water off California coast was warm? I don't know. One thing is for sure, when you cry wolf like this, like this fellow has, uh, people tend to think you're not honest about anything. So even if they're, this one's totally above board, there's a lot of people gonna question that. All right, so whatever your choice, there are some good lessons on what and how to ditch and what not to do. In my next video, I'm gonna look at the survivability of ditching and how to mitigate the risk something that didn't happen this in this flight. Is it safe or is it a bad idea from the get-go? Uh, can you avoid overwater all the time? So stay tuned. If you like the video, uh, hit that uh, button and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters and I'll put them up here. 
uh, really help it. They really help me uh, support the ch support the channel and do these videos. If you'd like to uh, support the Flywire, I'll put a link to the Patreon page down below. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire. Click this link for the latest upload. Click this link for whatever YouTube thinks you ought to watch. Or you can click this link to subscribe. Thanks for watching.